Welcome to Everything Business Consulting. Whether you are or you want to become a successful and high-earning business consultant, coach, or advisor, this show is dedicated to help you. Here are our hosts, David Thexton and Julius Bloom. Today, I'm excited to interview Anne Andrews, who is an entrepreneur, a keynote speaker, an HR expert, a consultant, at one point in time, a franchisor, and the way I discovered her, an author. Above all, our guest today is an expert when it comes to people and leadership. And there doesn't seem to be much that you can't do. So are you ready to share your vast knowledge and experience on our podcast? I most certainly am, Julius, and there's heaps of things I can't do, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems like there's a lot you can do, and, and I want to understand a little bit more about you before we get into it, and where you've come from. And can you tell us where it started and what it took to get to where you are now? Yes, so um, I came from a very small town in the north of um, England where there wasn't very much work. And my mum had been in the Women's Royal Navy during the Second World War. And although it was a terrible time, um, she sounded as if she had a ball, actually. Uh, And so I thought that seemed like a really good thing to do. So I joined the Women's Royal Navy. And after basic training, I never actually did work for the Navy. I was seconded to work with the Royal Marines. And the division of men, and in those days, women didn't go to the front line. We were very much back office. Um, And the division of men I went to work with were actually what we now know as SAS. Uh, In other words, the men in our office were simply there waiting for the next whatever call up they would get, which in those days was quite a lot of northern trouble in uh, Northern Ireland. And what that meant for us in our office, um, we were very boring, really, paying records. Um, But what it meant was in our office, we all had to swap jobs every three to six months so we could all cover each other for when our men would disappear because we could come in one morning and suddenly all the men would have gone. And we literally had to keep all the paying records going till they came back. And so uh, what I witnessed in the, in the Royal Marines was the most amazing leadership and the most amazing teamwork. And I worked with them for four years. So after my basic, uh, after my four years um, stint, um, my first civilian job was actually with Johnson & Johnson, the baby products people. And I got a job as a work study engineer, what we call over this part of the world, time and motions. Uh, basically, my job would be to go out onto the factory floor with my clipboard and my stopwatch, no technology in those days, watch what people did, time what they did, come back to the office with the rest of the work study engineers, and we would work out how they could work faster, smarter, cheaper. And I just thought this was really bizarre. And I asked, why don't we involve the people that are doing the job? And, of course, they said, what would they know? And, well, they're doing the job. And it just started me thinking about this, the way we work thing. Anyway, left the, uh, left the job, um, had my children, survived teenagers, came back many, many years later as um, personal manager for Teagle Poultry. And um, at that point, I really had no qualifications. I'd just kind of fallen into all my jobs. And they sent me off to Auckland University to do the diploma in business in um, personnel management, uh, a two-year paper. And the very first term, I heard about the self-managing teams of the Yorkshire coal mines during the Second World War. And of course, that's all my background. I'm from Yorkshire. Um, you know, my mum had been in the services and so forth. So what had happened during the Second World War, like my Navy situation, men shipped out to fight and women for the first time in history took over everything. They ran um, ambulances, um, munition factories, so forth. So um, eventually as the war, you know, progressed, um, more and more men obviously were not coming back and more and more men were required to go to fight. And one, uh, the government said to the mines, um, the coal mines, which is the only place women were not put, um, but the government said to the mines, the mine managers, we need more men. And the mines were saying, we we can't give you any more men. We're at a skeleton crew now. 
So, and they said, we want more men and we're going to take more men. So it's up to you to work out how you're going to do that. And then, of course, also they said, we need more, we need more coal. So it's like, okay, well, this, how on earth is this supposed to work? So one mine manager in the south of Yorkshire came up with the concept of the self-managing team. And basically he said to his guys, I can't give you a supervisor. I don't have enough men. You know the job. You know about your safety. You know about production. You know we've got a water fight. All I can ask is do the best you can. So what they did was um, doubled production, in reduced safety, because suddenly they were in charge of themselves. They were self-managing. Yeah. So I came back to Table Poultry with this magnificent new idea and said to my general manager, who had been at the job about two weeks, I said, we need to turn the whole plant over to self-managing teams. Well, after he'd got and picked himself up off the floor, <laughs> stopped laughing, he said, Anne, and of course, when somebody uses your name in that tone, you know it's not about to be followed by good news. You're in trouble. And, yeah. They'd want more money. The unions would kill us. And in case you haven't noticed, poultry processing workers aren't very bright. Wow. So I was not impressed. Anyway, I kept nagging at him. And said, look, just give me a team. I, I don't know anything. I, I don't know any more than anybody else. But I've got my background in teams. I've got my background in work study. Just give me a team. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. So, of course, he gave me the team with the worst accident record, thinking it will either show up. In fact, I think he just thought it would just shut me up. When, of course, we turned the place around, you know, basically all we did was I said, tell me what's working. Tell me what isn't. Tell me why you think that isn't. Tell me what you think we can do about it and basically put people in charge of their own areas. So we reduced accidents, we reduced absenteeism, we increased motivation. Um, yeah, I mean, it was just really simple. So that really was the start of it. So I'd been there for a few years when I got a, an offer to uh, go and work for a very flash computer company. So um, I took the job thinking, well, it was about double my salary, so that was a really lovely incentive. Um, but I, And it was to set up high-performing teams for them because they had lots of problems too. Um, but within a very short space of time, I realised that we had a values clash. Um, I'm about people and they were about profits. And... It didn't take me long to work out. I, I shouldn't have taken the job. Um, but anyway, I, I made up my mind. I had to be there for two years to get it on my CV. I had an amazing salary. So I thought I'm going to just put away as much money as I can because at some stage I, I will go out on my own. And that's really where it all stemmed from. And that is when I made the leap from being an employee to setting up as a consultant. And when you started out, Anne, you set up a company by the name of the David Principle. Yeah. Is there a story a behind story. that name? Yeah. It was just a little story I read about a consultant actually in the UK who'd been working with the British Rail when, of course, they were shutting all the railway lines down. So um, she had called her company. She told the story of, you know, when David was being carved, the Statue of David, Michelangelo didn't actually see a block of marble. He just saw David inside and just freed up the stuff that wasn't David. And she said to her company, I don't know your answers. You do. But what I will do is I will show you how to bring those answers forward. And it just really struck me because I was the same. I, you know, I would go with a, a, to a company that had some kind of specialised whatever, and I'd say, I don't, I don't know your um answers but what I do know is your people know your answers so let me work with your people and let's see what we can do to sort out the problems you're having because usually problems are down to people it's like you've you've unveiled the yeah. the solution uncovered. that they already see uncovered it yeah, yeah absolutely I can yeah. I can because see if how you that ask, works. yeah if you ask any employee what are the problems around here they'll tell you They'll tell you. And then when you say to them, but why haven't you told your manager? They'll say, we've told them and we've told them and we've told them and we've told them. 
And it's not that managers and owners are bad. It's just that they've got their own challenges. And all they hear from employees is what they see as whinging and whining. Absolutely. I've found that. Yeah. I've found that, and that that employees and, and staff within a business can be an incredibly valuable source of information on how to of improve course. it. Of course, absolutely. They'll tell you exactly what the problems are. Well, yeah. now how long and have you been self-employed and working in your own business and, and how did you come to the decision, you sort of alluded to it before, that you were ready to become self-employed? Mm. Well, I've been working for myself for over 30 years now. Um, I just knew with this particular company where I, my soul basically died. Um, and I knew pretty much from day one I had to get out and I didn't want to go from the frying pan to the fire. And so I guess I'd been planning for about two years to go out on my own. And it's scary, you know. I mean, I'd never worked for myself before. I'd always had a job and a salary and a, a company car and, you know, health insurance and all of those wonderful things. So I knew it was a massive decision. But there were so many problems at this particular company and they were so close to being illegal. Um I basically negotiated my own redundancy and I negotiated a year's salary. Well, it's, it's not, a, not a bad way to leave. It's a, a, yeah. perhaps the best way you could leave somewhere like that. Yeah. You mentioned uh, it can be a little bit scary going out on your own and we find that some of our listeners who are considering becoming a business consultant when they're starting out, they feel the exact same way. They can be apprehensive uh, about starting something new. <clears throat> what advice would you give them? Well, as I say, for, for me, I, I, I felt I didn't have a great deal of choice. Though, having said that, um, I had uh, I was a solo mum with two teenagers, so it was a massive decision. You know, I had a mortgage, a car to run and all of those kind of things. So having tucked away a bit of money, that gave me a little bit of security. Um, but I also knew it would take me a while to get work. Uh, yes, I've got the, you know, the credibility of being able to say, look, I've worked with teams, I'm ex-services. And that's a huge credibility factor being ex-services, strangely enough. Um, but I still didn't have any way to prove to them that, um, to other com to companies that I can do this for you. So what I did was oh, a couple of things. The first thing I did was I started networking, obviously. You've got to start to, to do that and get to know people and start to collect business cards and start to get to know people. But in the interim also, because I'd been a woman in the corporate world, with all that that entailed 30 years ago, and I'm not sure in some companies whether it's any better, um, I started running workshops for women. So that gave me some cash flow. That was my first thing. But the other thing I did was um, I learned to be able to ask questions of the various people I wanted to work with. And what I did by way of a, a, a trial with the very first company that showed some interest in what I was doing, I said, look, I don't know um, how to do this consultancy thing other than the fact that I've been doing this team thing. So what I'd like to do with you is I would like to give you a fee because my work is once a month for six months, four to six months, depending. You don't, you don't change um, organisations overnight. So I'd say, look, I will be working with you once a month for six months. What I'd like to do, if you're okay, is I will um, invoice you for half my fee up front and then you don't pay me another cent until I have got the results that you want. And it was, so it said I've got skin in the game. Yep. And my first company was a concrete company. And because, honestly, manufacturing for me was my passion. I love manufacturing plants um they're so to the the just earthy you know people tell it like it is there's no people stab you in the front in manufacturing they don't stab you in the back you can see it coming <laughs> you know you've been stabbed um and so that gave me my first contract 
um, with some money up front because I negotiated half my fee, but it also let me show that um, if you give me absenteeism, accident rate, turnover, all of those measures, I will give you, I will work towards getting, and I think we, we decided on 10% reduction in accidents or a 20% reduction in absenteeism or something. Um, and, and that's how I got my first contract. So that's your stepping stone. If, if a, as a new person, you put some skin in the game. In fact, I've even had clients where I've said, don't pay me until you're happy. Wow. I'll come that's, in. That's brave. I'll come in and work with you because I know, I know that I can do what I say I can do. And so people wow. say, well, yeah, come in. Why not? Also, why wouldn't they? Yeah, why, they why wouldn't lose? they? Yeah. Give me your team for half a day. Don't pay me. And I will come back in a month and we'll see what, what's happened. And when you're happy, you pay me. I don't do that now because I don't need to. Of course. Yeah. And you you mentioned before you were asking some questions uh, of, of presumably the managers and business owners at the start. What, what were you trying to find out or what was the objective of these questions? Well, I heard about this because I'd never been in a consultant before and I never had my own business. I went off on all these workshops on, you know, how to be how to become a salesperson. I've never been a salesperson. How to market, how to, you know, all of these things. And one of the things was, you know, the 30 second in the lift thing. Yep, the elevator pitch. Yeah. Yes, the elevator pitch. So I worked on that for a while. I was terrible at it for quite a while. Um, but I worked out, all I had to say to somebody if I met them was, do you have staff? And that was it. That's all I had to say. And they go, oh, yeah, I've got staff. <laughs> I was in. I was in. It was just that's, that simple. That's, uh, that's very funny you say that, Anne, because typically what happens with our consultants who are focused more as general business consultants than, than the specific type of consulting you do is, is all our consultants need to say is, how's your business going? Yeah. And then it goes, the same sort of reaction. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. And, and, and almost certainly staff is, is a big one that comes up. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. I've just said, and the, the, there is a bit of a difference between the consulting that you do and the business consulting that we focus on. However, I'm absolutely certain that a lot of your skill and knowledge would translate and be relevant to our listeners. Uh, can I ask you, what is consulting the way you perceive it? Um, consulting to me is um, being passionate about some aspect of business yourself. To my mind, I am passionate about people. And if you're passionate about what you do, you don't have to sell it. You, it's people get it. If if you if you're a passionate marketer, if you say, look, I can show you a way to market your business so that you get a you know 20% return on your investment or whatever. If you come from passion and you know your topic and you've proven that you can do it, um, it's a no-brainer. Yes, in the initial stages when you're first starting, you don't have that knowledge that you can do it. But I still believe if you're passionate about what you do, people will give you a go. Especially if you, passion. yeah, yeah, especially if, as I've said, you know, you're willing to put your skin in the game. I mean, I've, I've known um, consultants say, oh, well, I'm not going to um, go and do that unless I'm paid out front. And it's like, well, um, do you know that you can do what you say you do? Really? Do you know 100%? Because if you don't know for sure, if this is your first contract, that's the wrong attitude. If you say to somebody, I am happy to come in and work with you for half a day to show you how to do X, Y, Z, and if at the end of it you're not happy with what I've shown you, I won't invoice you, who's going to turn that down? And who, after you've spent half a day with your person and your passion nobody is not going to pay you I've never not been paid ever ever oh, you're exuding passion there and so I can see see how that would absolutely work with you now one of the 
most important roles of a business consultant and a consultant in general is to act as a leader in their clients' businesses without obviously becoming over-controlling and dictating to the owners and the leaders that are still within the organization. Now, and how can you balance this leadership and influence whilst bu building strong long-term relationships within the business? Mm. Yeah, I, I have to be careful because I can be a bit bossy. My husband says not a bit bossy, very bossy. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, look, I know how to do this stuff. Just listen to me. Just do this and this and this. And I have to, I have to learn. I had to learn. Um, you can't go in that way. People don't like you being bossy. So all I do is I come from a question point of view. Have you thought of? Have you considered? Have you tried? Um, it's what I call planting seeds. I know if I'm sitting with an owner and he says to me, look, my people, I've got a high turnover or whatever, whatever. I know, I know I can help them. But I also know that they're in a fearful state. You know, they're worried, they're stressed, they're not sleeping. Um, it's almost like the, the, they've got a fog around them and you're trying to say, look, you can do this if you do it. And it's like, no, it's, it's almost like um, it's what I call overwhelm. You can offer the best advice in the world, but they're in such a, a state of stress that anything that you suggest is just more stress. Isn't it? It just gives them more stress. Oh, no, I can't do that because so all I do is I plant seeds. Have you thought of, did you consider, what have you tried? I might even have a story to say, look, I, I was working with a, a client who and he had this and that, whatever, and then leave them with it. Um, you don't have to get a sign up the minute you're with somebody. I, I, I would maybe sit in, at a networking event or whatever and say, have you thought of, have you tried? And they go, oh, no, I can't do that. I say, look, that's okay. Let's swap cards. Um, I'll send you some, I'll send you an article or I'll send you something. And so I started a slow relationship with some people. Um, you can't always rush in and get the order straight away, you know. How often is that likely to happen? So you've just got to build trust, really. Um, and then, I mean, I've, I've had some people on my books for 15 years you know, who've done nothing. And then suddenly out of the blue, they call me because I send out, new, I send out regular newsletters, I stay in touch, I might have a book special or, you know, I just, I, I keep contact with people in my database and I don't sell, sell, sell. I think that's the worst thing you can do. How do you how do you keep a consistent um, flow of work? Um, I, it isn't consistent, consistent, and, and I guess I'm kind of semi-retired now. Um, but um, I've just got a routine where um, I I do a, a newsletter. I've got three or four different databases, and every week I write I write something. I love writing; it's my thing. So I write a newsletter um, to various things. I put them on LinkedIn and it just builds my database. I send out my newsletter. Um, some weeks, like last week, I got two conference call, two calls for me to speak at a conference. The week before that, nothing. You know, so it's just, I just keep my newsletter going. Um, I'm not in a financial situation now where I urgently need work. I mean, I like shopping, so um, <laughs> it's nice to have somewhere. And I don't want to vegetate, um, but it's just my routine. If I write on LinkedIn, I put some uh, my newsletters out. I do a little bit of networking, not a lot. Um, oh, the other thing I didn't mention, um, but um, one of the things I do a lot of is joint ventures. Um, like um, coming up, I've got um, a crisis management session with two other presenters. Um, I was invited into that by um, a person I've known for a few years. I've got um, a workshop coming up with two other presenters on um, franchising. Um, so I just do little things like that. So it's just a 45-minute presentation. You share the marketing. You share the, you know, costs and the what have you, the organising, and you always get work out of it, always. I've never not got work out of one of those, ever. Yeah. 
So and is, is it like just, a paid engagement and then you get work out of it from that or yeah, do you do it? It's, it's a, it's, we call it a showcase. So like with this crisis management one that's coming up, uh, we charge $247 plus just yep. per person. Um, we, we do a half day. So it's a pretty cheap half day. Yep. There's three of us and we each come from a slightly different angle and we all get work out of it. Wow. That's so the audience gets value. You know, they've got a half day for $247. Yep. You don't get, they don't all, but then they go on your database and then you start the cycle, you start the newsletter, you're there. you've got your little wheel that keeps going. I was going to ask yeah. you as well, how um, how have you built your database? You said you've got 8,000 people on there. That's a, that's a pretty decent well, That's database. LinkedIn. That's on LinkedIn. I don't know how I've built that. I've just put an article on most weeks. Um, it just I, goes up I and get, up and up. Yeah, I, and I, I, I don't. Um, oh, and I've joined a few groups. Um, I don't use LinkedIn anything like I'm supposed to. I'm sure I don't. But I've got eight thousand <laughs> people. Well, that's um, nothing but, to sneeze at. That's for sure. Well, I don't know where they come from, but they just keep coming. Um, but my big thing is my own database, and that's just business cards, people I meet pop them on the database, workshops, like we've got these two workshops coming up. We'll have maybe, I don't know, 40 people on each. That's 80 business cards, 80 more people go on my database. Yeah, just providing providing value and keeping in touch. And I really yeah. like what you said and about planting the seeds. Now, that could, yeah. be, could be seen perhaps as a, a little bit of a magic trick. And I want to ask this next question specifically about your HR expertise, are there any magic tricks in that realm that business owners and managers should know about that they probably don't know about when it comes to getting most the most out of their people? Uh, I, I mean this is the this is the missing link that I talked about earlier. I mean I if I if I'm working with a group of managers, I'll say um, what do you what do you tell your people about the business? And they say, oh, we tell them everything. And when I look sit, sit with the employees without the manager, they say, what does your boss tell you? They say, they tell us nothing. And so it's this gap in the middle of communication, of building trust. It's no different um, from us building relationships with our clients. Owners and managers need to talk to their people, ask them questions, get involved, know about them, talk to them. Um, find out their challenges, you know. The, the, the single biggest thing I leave any owner and manager with is the, the, the need to have regular one-on-ones with their people. And so few of them go, oh, I haven't got time for that. Really? Well, I think you need to find some time for that. It's only 10 or 15 minutes maybe or a coffee every night. How are you going? How are things? Make it okay for them to tell you. You know, if you look at some of the things that are going on in the world right now with businesses where there's this disconnect where, you know, directors don't communicate with people and people don't know what's going on, communicate with your people. They're humans. They're not machines. They have homes and lives and, you know, I quite often get a call to say, oh, look, you know, one of my best performers is just a pain in the neck right now and they're not performing. So have you asked them why? Uh, no. Well, how about sitting and saying, how are you? <laughs> they might be going through a marriage breakup. They they're giving, they're giving the Anne the call. Room. They're giving <laughs> Anne the call to see if you've got the answer. Yeah. Have you asked them? Talk to them. Oh, no, I haven't got time for that. Well, please make time. Make time to talk to your people. Yeah, so it's just all of those interesting little human things the humans yeah I, I heard a very good quote and and i'm paraphrasing here but something to the effect of everyone has a neon flashing sign on their chest saying i want to feel appreciated yes and, and all that feel, takes is yeah. some time and and finding out how they're going and yeah. and then like you said, it might only be 10 or 15 minutes once a week or once a fortnight. And for that other 40 or, or 80 hours that they're working in that time period, it's going to really pay off for you. Yeah, they feel valued. valued. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I come back to the table poultry thing. You know, when, when my lovely general manager said, oh, you can't 
doing something, can't be doing self-managing. I don't know, maybe they can, maybe they can, but what's the worst in giving it a go? And so as I worked with a particular team and said, you know, how are things and what what are the problems here? And they start to tell you and you build trust with them. You get to know them as people. I think the big the big problem for a lot of owners and managers, and it's not that they're bad people, they're, they're great people, most of them, um, it's that they haven't got, they think they haven't got time They haven't got time to talk to the people. But my belief is if you take the time to talk to your people in the good times, when the bad times hit, they'll be your biggest supporter. They will step forward and say, how can I help? But if you've ignored them through the good times, when the bad times come and you say, oh, well, we need every shoulder to the pump, they're going, yeah, well, stuff you. You know, you weren't there for me when my marriage broke up and you weren't there for me when my dad died or whatever. You know, you've got to build those relationships. Um, Yes, it takes a bit of time, but losing, and that's the other thing, of course, if you don't value your people, uh, Zig Ziglar said um, his was about training. There's only one thing worse than training your people and having them leave, and that's not training them and having them stay. Well, the same comes to value. There's only one thing worse than not valuing your people and having them leave, and that's not valuing them and having them stay because they really are your robots. Your, you know, show up at nine and leave at five and leave their brains at door people. Yeah. Yeah, so I, that's my HR rant. Your HR rant, I like it. <laughs> yeah. I To add to that, I've actually found and that having that com- those conversations and just asking how people are and asking asking them what what they could see uh, needing improvement within a business and stuff as a as a consultant i found that i've very very quickly built relationship with people within a business that mm. exceeds the relationship that their managers have with them Absolutely. just by giving them the time of day and and that's yeah. not how it should be but it's how it often is oh, no and as I say, I've got, I, I do give owners and managers the benefit of the doubt, and I know that they're busy, and I know that they've got their own challenges, and they see it as time wasted. But once I, there's another of the planted seeds, one of the, if I can plant that seed, if when I'm finished working with your team, I leave you asking you once a month, sit with each of your people for 10 or 15 minutes, buy them a coffee, ask them how they're going, then you, you, the work I've done with them will continue. If I leave and you don't, then you've just wasted your money with me. In fact, worse, because you've set a scene that said we care about you, but only as long as somebody's here, you know, a consultant. And once they're gone, it's like, oh, well, you know, you had your, you had your three weeks of um, somebody, you know, warm fuzzying you. Now get on with the job. Don't do that. Better not to have me in the first place. You've had, you've given them their medicine and then their fixed river. Yeah. Looking at uh, your experience as a consultant, when you're giving this advice and the other advice that you give, how do you persuade your clients to implement these ideas and strategies and, and keep it going for the long term? Um, well, quite often I um, I set a, 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 some reviews where they know that I'll be coming, <laughs> they know that I'll be coming back. Um, it's sometimes the best I can do is to say, okay, part of my fee that you've just paid me is that I will come back in three months and six months and 12 months and you don't pay me another cent. I will just pop back and see how things are going. So very rarely do I ever get to do the three reviews, but I think it's just the fact that they know that, um, oh, my God, she's going to be coming back and checking up on me. so yeah. it's that accountability yeah. that keeps them yeah. going. Yeah, absolutely. And I keep coming back to the whole thing about, you know, when I'm working with an owner or a manager, as I say, what is it? what is in it for you? What's the whiffing for you to have people do things differently? And that's when they say, well, you know, we've got it's morale's low at the moment and all my good people are leaving and we've got customer complaints. So if you think of all those things and we can fix them, it's like it's like your car. You don't take it in for a service once in its lifetime. You have regular checks. How are we going? 
um, if it's a big organisation, do surveys. How are things going? Are we slipping back? How are we going forward? And listen to what they're telling you. People, you know, the, this 360-degree feedback thing came out. Uh, it was the flavour of the month for a while and quite a lot of organisations said, oh, my God, it was all just bad news, so we just chucked it all away. It's like, well, that bad news is actually the potential to turn it into good news. You know, it's, yeah, um, yeah, it's it's tricky. We're getting delivered with opportunities and yeah. deciding not to act upon them. Yeah, no. Yeah, too hard. No, well, it isn't too hard. It mustn't be too hard. It comes with your job. I mean, one of the things I say to you, uh, which um, gets me into a lot of um, companies, is I say, um, if I could free you up by 30% to be working on the business rather than in it, would that be worth you having me come and talk to you and your people? <gasps> yes, absolutely. But then when I show them how we do the 30% freed up, because I say, would you like Fridays off? Yeah, I'd love Fridays off. Cool. Okay, well, I can get you Fridays off. I can show you how to get Fridays off so easily you would be staggered. So to get the Friday off, what we have to do is get them to start delegating, of course, handing over things that they shouldn't be doing. Um, and then I say, okay, well, now I've freed you up Friday. Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like your Friday morning to be spent with your people and then your Friday afternoon you can go and play golf. But your Friday morning is going to be spent doing these one-on-one, -on -one, sitting with people and saying, how are you going? Where are you at? How can I coach and develop you? What are your five-year goals? All of those kind of things. So it's just little things like that. And it's not that they're bad people. It's just that they're busy working in when they need to be working on, you know? They shouldn't Absolutely. be doing, yeah, they shouldn't be doing the $30 an hour jobs. Um, we, we call that chicken plucking, Anne, doing those, yeah. doing those menial tasks that they shouldn't yeah. be doing. Busy being busy, busy looking busy, busy wandering around with a clipboard, whatever the equivalent is, yeah. That's not no. your job. No, it's not. Now, undoubtedly, Anne, many of the lessons that you have learned have been the result of struggle. In the book that I've read of yours, which is My Dear Franchisees, and there'll be a link in the show notes for you to find out uh, about Anne's book where you can get that and her other books. This was the result of some serious frustration that you had. Now, I want to ask about the lessons you learned and the process of franchising because that's what the book is about. If any of our consultants were working with a business considering franchising, what are the most important things that they should consider? Yeah, okay, so just to step back to how I came to franchise, um, because um, I worked with quite a lot of corporates in New Zealand and Australia where I would be with them for two or three years which is very exciting, um, but eventually I, I just burnt out uh, because if I got in with a corporate, they'd say, look, we've got 14 teams and I work with each team once a month for four months, four to six months. You start to multiply that by 16 teams. So I was pretty much burning out and I thought I've got to, uh, I've got to do something with this. I've got to bring in other trainers or I've got to uh, because there's, there's, um, there's only me, I'm on my own. Now, my husband already had a franchise. He um, had 32 franchises and he said, you can franchise it. So basically a franchise is a system. It's just a system. And I had a system four to six months working with a team. So I franchised and one, I signed, uh, I think I sold 11 franchises at around $25,000 each in 18 months. And my husband thought this was, brilliant he thought this was just he was going to retire and let me let me keep him to, in the manner to which he would like to become accustomed <laughs> <laughs> and um so um one by one I watched them fall over um and so hence the book um because what I, what I would say to anybody who is a thinking of becoming a franchisor and b working with franchise but working with franchisors is a franchise is a franchise is a franchise. And a lot of people don't get that. Even franchisors sometimes don't get that. A franchise is a system. It is not to be tampered with. 
you know, you spent years, I spent years building my six-step process, sold them to lovely people. I, I recruited meticulously trainers and cons- um, people who were already HR people. But as soon as they got my franchise, they wanted to change it. And, of course, I'm saying don't change it. It works. Oh, but I think I couldn't. Don't change it. It works. So um, hence the letter, hence the book. Um, So if you're working as a franchisor, I get it that your franchisees will drive you mad because they'll want to change the system. What I say to franchisors is um, give them my book. And it's not just to sell the book. But once once franchisees read it, they go, oh, now I understand. My franchisor isn't my enemy. No, they're not my banker. No, Um, the system works. Yes. So why would you spend your time trying to change a system when you've just paid all that money to buy it? You know, it just doesn't make any sense. So it's a tricky business model because franchisees, to a degree, have bought a business. They think they've bought, well, they have, they've bought a business, but it isn't their own business. It's somebody else's business. So it is a tricky model. But once they get it, then they relax and realize that don't waste your time trying to change something that already works. It doesn't mean that after a year or two of doing the system, you can't say to your franchise, oh, look, I've got a couple of ideas that we can do it better. It doesn't mean you can't do that. But in your first year, don't touch a thing. Just follow the manual. Yeah. It is a tricky business model. And what was no what was the end result of, of your franchise, Anne? Um, so I had got down to my last three franchisees. I'd signed up 11. I'd got down to my last three. And all three of them were really good. Um, they, they'd, all, they'd been with me for about two years. And so they got past all that wanting to change everything and got to realise that, Uh, the the things that I was doing worked. Um, It didn't mean we couldn't change things later, but let's just go with what we've got. So I was down to three. And unfortunately, my mum in the UK got sick and I was having to go back, and I'm an only child, so I was having to go backwards and forwards to the UK to just help my mum get settled and um, then come back. And so while I was away, one of my franchisees called me and said, look, I'm really, really sorry, um, but uh, it's not working for me. I don't have the network. I'm not a salesperson. Um, I'd like to be released. And I said, absolutely, no problem at all. I mean, it wasn't, I wouldn't have even questioned it. It's, uh, there's no way I would want somebody to say that wasn't happy and it wasn't working. So see, he, he went in and got a job and that was fine. Um, the, the second franchisee um, was also ex-military. And Mm -hmm. so I knew he could be brilliant, but he was working with a big company and they offered him a job as their in-house trainer. And I was overseas and I said, "Um, look, all all I want to say to you is I totally understand. It's very flattering that you're offered a job and a salary and all the lovely trimmings. All I want to say, and if you decide that you want to do that, I I won't stand in your way. All I want to say to you is just know that when a company is in trouble, the first person that's shown the door is the, is the trainer. It's the trainer, yep. And he said, I'll take that risk. I said, that's actually fine. I t- that's fine. And a year later, he was made redundant, poor guy. But that's cool. But my third franchisee was my b- biggest disappointment. Um, just before I went overseas to actually bury my mum, um, I had just signed up a big contract for about $28,000 with a company. And I said, look, I can't I can't do it. Um, I've got to go back to the UK, but I've got this brilliant franchisee and she can do it just as good as me, if not better. So I left the, the contract with her. And by the time I came back and I'd cleaned up an estate um, and got back home, I suddenly thought, I haven't seen any reports come through because, you know, you get a monthly report of what you've sold and and so your fees and all of that kind of thing. I haven't heard anything for months, but I've got so many other things happening. It just had gone past me. 
So when I came back, I thought, that's really strange. So um, I contacted the person. I said, oh, I haven't um, had any reports. And she said, oh, no, they decided not to go ahead. So I said, oh, okay. Oh, well, that's all right. That, that's sad. You know, and, and, how are you doing? And she said, no, no, I'm okay. And a week later, I got a call from the company, quite out of the blue. And they said, oh, we are so delighted with her. I went, what? Um, she taken my $28,000 contract and she paid me what I did. It was supposed to pay me what I don't know, 2% fees or 5% fees or whatever. And I was burying my mum. So I closed her down. Yeah, so I closed her down that night. I closed her down that night. And, of course, my husband said, look, don't worry about it. You know, they reckon that it takes you 13 franchisees before you get it right. And I said, uh, no, <laughs> the computer says no, I couldn't do it again. It was too heartbreaking. So now what I do now is if I, if I get more work than I can cope with, I've got about four or five people I know, I can pass the work over to them. They give me a finder's fee. I'm happy, they're happy. So I do it that way. So that was disappointing. Yeah. But it's just the nature of business, isn't it? Um, yeah. Just sad. That is, that is very sad. And to close this interview, perhaps on a lighter note, Anne. Oh, sorry, that's it. <laughs> could you, it's okay. Could you, I'm over it. <laughs> could you give us uh, and our listeners a couple of gold nuggets of advice that will help them in their consulting careers? Yeah, it's definitely have some skin in the game. Um, it, it's a, it's a, a very tenuous relationship when you first start out as a consultant with a new client. Um, consultancy can get a pretty bad name, you know, because there are people who will um, take your money, sell you a lovely pitch, take your money, and then leave you with not a lot. Um, don't be one of those consultants. Have skin in the game. Put your um, credibility on the line by saying, I am with you until we get this result. Um, look after your clients. It's, it's the age-old adage. If you look after your clients, they will pass leads to you. Um, I, the number of people that I, I don't even have to market much anymore now. I'll get a call. They've been talking to somebody. Who did you work with their team? Could you come and talk to me? Who did you spoke at their conference? We'd like you to come and speak at ours. Build your business for the long haul. You may be able to get some really fast bucks early, but if there's no substance, it won't last and your credibility. You've only got one reputation. That's it. Once your name is mud, it's mud. Mud forever. And do you have any other nuggets for us or is, is that the, the entire gold pan? Oh, yeah. Uh, one, of the things, uh, one of the things I learned early on, somebody passed this on to me uh, when I was starting off as a consultant and I was so convinced I could change the world and I could, everybody needed me and all of the kind of wonderful things. And of course, you get your knockbacks. Um, and it comes back to, it's a kind of the planting seeds thing. Um, this, this person said, some owners change when they see the light. Other owners change when they feel the heat. Some change when they see the light, others when they feel the heat. So that's why I stay in touch with people. If I talk to somebody and they say, oh, look, that's really nice, and I'm sure that was wonderful, but just not right now. That's okay. That's cool. I've got their business card. I'll pop them on my database. I contact them to say, look, I just I put out a monthly newsletter with your tips and tools. If you'd like to stay on my database, that, that's cool, you know, whatever. Um, very rarely do people say, no, I don't want to be on your database. And so once a month, I send them, and as I say, uh, one client, 15 years, he's been on my database. And finally, he said, I think we need you. You felt the heat. Yeah, so, yeah, I know, 15 years. I, I didn't even know he was still on there. Yeah. yeah. So just be in it for the long haul. Um, if anyone listening to this podcast wants to connect with you, where can they find you? Uh, I've got a website, and uh, dub, 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 and Andrews. Um, dot co dot nz that's Anne without an e um, or they can email me email me Anne at Anne Andrews dot co dot nz 
Um, I've got a few free things that I send to people. I've got a wonderful um, flip book. Um, you know, you can turn ebooks now into flip books. Um, I've got a flip book. Um, I've just had converted um, leaders behaving badly. Um, I wrote that when I saw the terrible things that Donald Trump was doing, um, looking at the values, leaders' values. So it's a story of leaders who are doing terrible things, but leaders who are doing amazing things. So if they'd like to email me, um, I'm happy to send them a flip um, ebook of leaders behaving badly. Well, I'll make sure I put the information in the show notes yeah. as, as well. And I highly recommend uh, subscribing to your regular newsletter because it's incredibly valuable for anyone who wants to improve themselves and in the leadership space or is dealing with people and can listen and make use of your very insightful insights. Well, Anne, yeah. thank you very much for that very frank and interesting interview. I'm sure our listeners will have gained a lot from it. You're very welcome, Julius. And I say to, to any consultant, it's the best job in the world. Everything Business Consulting is brought to you by Consultex, a complete training, software, and community for business consultants, coaches, and advisors. Consultex guides you through the entire process to success. To find out more, visit consultex.com.